Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Educators, Performers, Creators, our edition number 17. And our topic today is languages and communities. Oh, mistake there. It's not 18, it's 17. We are live for all of you from the Twin Cities. And if you're watching this show live or recorded, please participate with your comments or questions. You can send a tweet with the hashtag EPC show. Send a tweet with the hashtag EPC show or you can post your comments or questions on the Google Plus event or on YouTube. Today I'm joined by Dr. Richard Benton from lovinglanguage.wordpress.com and Julie Knopp, Director of City State at mycitystate.org. And again, we are we are live, so if you're here with us, feel free to send us your questions or comments about the topic, languages and communities. You can do that by sending a tweet with the hashtag EPC show or po just post your question on the Google Plus event or on YouTube. So I would like to say hello to our guests today. Hello, Julie. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Paulina. Great. So Ju Julie, tell me a little bit about yourself and about what you do. Uh, well, my name is Julie Knapp. I am the founder and director of City Stay, and I've been doing that for about four years. I was raised in the Twin Cities, and I'm really happy to be doing something to give a little bit back to the community that I love so much. Great. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And Richard, hello. How are you? I'm very good, thanks. Thank you for the honor of being able to uh, participate with your show and with Julie, whom I respect very much. Thank you. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do. So I am a language lover and polyglot. I speak uh, six or seven languages. Uh, I have a PhD in Hebrew and linguistics, and I also am a big language advocate, and so I speak publicly about the importance of learning languages. Great. So thank you for being here as well. And I would like everyone to be thinking throughout this show about what you think are the connections between languages and communities as we carry on with this discussion. And again, if you have any questions or comments, don't forget to join us in this discussion. We're going to start with Richard. Richard, if you could please tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you start this idea of language learning? Where did it come from? So I started la learning languages when I was um, 12 or 13 years old in middle school. Uh, over the summers, I would go away to camp to learn languages. I learned German, uh, Latin. I took linguistics. Um, in high school, I uh, had uh, a German teacher who was from the Netherlands, so I cornered her and I made her teach me Dutch. And uh, I took a Russian class at adult education. I took Italian in adult education. Uh, so by the time I was done with high school, I had taken uh, French, German, and Russian in school. I had taken Latin during the summer, Italian at night, and Dutch during lunchtime. So uh, I've been always very enthusiastic about learning languages. When I went to the university, uh, I already knew I was going to study linguistics, so it was just a matter of how many obscure languages do you teach at your school and where can I study abroad. So <laughs> I, studied, I studied modern Hebrew uh, at university. I spent my junior year in Kiev, Ukraine, and I learned Ukrainian while I was there. And uh, after college, I went to Morocco, and I lived in Morocco for a year. I learned uh, the Moroccan dialect of Arabic. And um, then um, I traveled, traveled further and learned languages here and there through travel. Uh, now that I'm older and hold a job and have a family and I'm a little bit more tied to where I'm at, one of the things I've been delving into is the languages that are around me. You know, in the Twin Cities here, there's lots of opportunities for learning languages. So. I still love traveling. I was able to travel for work to go to Portugal and I learned some Portuguese and I traveled on vacation to Greece and Turkey and learned a little bit of Greek and Turkish. But 
my love of language I learned is not necessarily tied to traveling. There's a lot to be learned right here in the Twin Cities or any city that I go to in the United States. So I'm very lucky that I'm able to continue my love of languages wherever I go um, in learning languages plus being able to speak to others who love languages or who want to love languages or who hate languages <laughs> and, who, and who I think could probably love them if we did a little bit of more work. But um, I uh, am you know, always advocating about how learning languages is something that, for me personally, it's a pleasure. I mean, it's like, you know, a painter who paints has love for painting itself. Me, as a language lover, I love language itself. But I also love what language brings me, which is connections with other people. Great, and uh, in our conversation, we have talked about uh, how people ch have different reasons for choosing learning languages. In your case, you love all kinds of languages, and you chose a lot of them. But uh, lately, um, you've been choosing languages that are in our community, in the Twin Cities. By the way, we, all three of us live in the Twin Cities. We are not just connecting virtually. But can you tell me a little more about what languages are you studying right now, or what language have you studied recently that are connected to your surrounding? Mm -hmm. So I, uh, let me give you a little bit of background on this. So I lived in Morocco, and I, I learned Moroccan Arabic, and I would go and visit my friends in Spain, which is right across the water. And a lot of the immigrants there were Moroccan, and they were poorer people, and there weren't very many Spanish people who were learning Arabic. So just for, just to kind of play with people's minds, I would go up to them and just all the, go up to Moroccans and suddenly start speaking Moroccan Arabic to them fluently, you know, just to see what kind of reaction I could get out of them. And they were always shocked and surprised, but almost every time delighted. And one of the things I realized was that people, especially immigrants who are used to uh, not using their language much in public, to be addressed in public in their own language was really a paradigm shift. And it was something that really made me think, what is it like for people who have to live their lives publicly in a language that is not theirs? Now, I was a traveler. I was only there for a year. I came back to my Anglophone country, and I can choose to not speak another language for the rest of my life. But what is the life of an immigrant who chooses to move to another country? So I wanted to make a connection with these sorts of people, and that's one of the reasons why I've moved into this. Uh, here in the Twin Cities, for those people who don't know, we have a huge East African population. We have over 70,000 Somalis. We have over 30,000 Oromo people who come from Ethiopia, and that's the largest, um, most widely spoken uh, native language in Ethiopia is Oromo, which most people haven't heard of. And then a lot of Amharic speakers, which is the native language, uh, which is the national language of uh, Ethiopia. And uh, this fascinated me. What is, it, what is it to be an East African in Minnesota? What is it like to interact with East Africans in Minnesota? So right off the bat, I started learning Somali. Actually, the way I met Julie before I came is uh, <laughs> I was Googling before I moved to the Twin Cities three years ago, Somali and culture and Minnesota and the Twin Cities, and that's how I found City Stay when City Stay was just coming up, and uh, that's how Julie and I got uh, uh, got acquainted is through that. I emailed her. I'm like, what, what are you guys doing with Somali in the Twin Cities? And uh, through email then, we, we got acquainted. And uh, since then, I've, I've given a couple talks through, uh, her, um, through her workshops, and all of those have been about how do you interact with the cultures in the Twin Cities. Now, one of the things I've noticed when doing community languages, oftentimes these are languages that are not taught commonly, which means they don't have cool apps for learning them. They don't have easy-to-find books for learning them. All you've got is the people. And in learning these languages, I had to interact with the people. I realized the way we teach languages in this country through books of learning a language without the people, it's a new phenomenon. It's only been around for a couple hundred years. For the rest of history, people have learned languages by talking to the people. And 
so that's what I strove to do. I strove to go and work with people and talk to people, and I, I like to wander around the Somali parts of town where I can use my language. Uh, when I go to the farmer's markets, a lot of the uh, people at the farmer's markets who are working are Hmong, and so I get an opportunity to learn a few words of Hmong here and there, and um, it creates very interesting conversations uh, because it's a unique situation where me as a white male in the Twin Cities uh, put myself in the position where I want to learn from uh, my my brothers and sisters who speak these other languages who come from all over the world. Uh, on Thursday I was at the airport and I heard a couple people ahead of me on the escalator. I, th I think I know what that language is. I think it's Oromo. I had taken an Oromo class at the at the community college, so I knew a few phrases and stuff. So I went up to them and I said, "Hey, how are you?" I said in, in Oromo, and they were completely surprised. Ends up that one of them was in the from the Twin Cities, the other one was from Australia. He just arrived from Australia, and here's a white guy speaking to him in Oromo, <laughs> and I can only imagine what he's thinking. The Twin Cities are, are like, but these are the kinds of just, I mean, for me, they're fun encounters with people. And, you know, they're like, what's your name? What do you do? And we get into, a, like, a real conversation right there on the escalator at the airport. I don't have those conversations with other people at the airport. <laughs> these are, these are the, that's, what, that's what my life is like in the Twin Cities. I mean, I have such a good time living here in a place that most people in the world do not associate with East African culture. But there's so much going on here, and it's a fascinating place to see the mix of you know, traditional um, Scandinavian, Germanic, Minnesota culture and East African culture. Uh, so this has been just a delight for me to be able to learn these uh, languages and get to know these people. Now, uh, Richard, you are an experienced language learner and obviously a language lover as well. Um, and we are fortunate here that we do have a good diversity of cultures and languages in the Twin Cities. But there might be some people out there who might want to explore some of these languages in their community. They might not be as outgoing as you and I can be <laughs> talking to people at the random at the airport. Um, and I know you know a lot of language learning techniques. So if I were to start with Oromo, for example, or any other language that is not commonly taught it, at schools, do you have any, maybe a couple of suggestions? Where could I start or look for? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing, uh, first thing I'm going to say is what you should not do. Don't be nervous. Don't be afraid. I'm just going to start with that because the anxiety of what if I say it wrong? Because you know what? If, you're the, if you say it wrong, you don't have to worry about anything. Everyone will be fine. But I would suggest the first thing is learn how to say hello and how are you. You don't even need to, have to, you don't even need to learn to say I'm fine. So I would say go online. Most languages, pretty obscure languages, you can find the greetings. Go online and say, all you have to do is Google hello in Oromo, and you'll find something on YouTube or on another site. Another thing that I've found works really well is you hear people speaking with an accent, or you hear people speaking in another language, and you can say, excuse me, do you speak a language other than English? Which is a nice way of saying things. You aren't assuming they don't e speak English, but you can learn more about them. Do you speak a language besides English? And, and usually they'll tell you, and you say, how do you say hello in your language? Then just say hello. Every time you see someone say hello, and you know what? If you forget, you have an opportunity to ask again. So the most basic resource I would say is go online and find a greeting, or go up to somebody and ask them how they say hello. Just start with hello. Those, those are great ideas to start learning those basics and we, uh, the, the basic phrases. But you did mention that um, for some of these languages, there, there won't be any flashy apps or textbooks to go deeper into the languages and we have to connect with people, interact with them. We have a question from Teresa and she's interested in knowing what resources do you use to find opportunities to interact live with people? What is your experience? 
So my experience is, especially with, I'm going to use Somali as an example because it's a more obscure one and there are fewer resources. Um, what I do is I go to a Somali coffee shop and I try to order my coffee in Somali. Um, and then I say, did I say that right? And they usually say yes because they're polite. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, and then I say, how would you how would you say this? And then they'll tell me. And I'll say, would you mind repeating that? And they'll say it back until I get it right. Um, really, it's that really it's that basic. I'll go to a, an Ethiopian restaurant and I'll say, how do you say this? At the parking garage by my work, for some reason, all the attendants speak Amharic, and so I'll always I'll always ask for another word. How do you say? I, I say, okay, I know how to say thank you. How do you say thank you, sir? And then I'll ask that. Or how do you say um, have a good day? And then I'll get that. And then at my quickest, at, as soon as I can, I'll go and write it down. People who are more um, technologically adept would could uh, you know record it on your phone so you can hear it. Uh, but those are the most for obscure languages that's the best thing for people who are learning more commonly taught languages like Spanish or Chinese or something like that um, that there's uh, for interacting live with people I think one of my favorite sites is italki.com I T A L K I dot com and that site is designed to pair up language learners with native speakers you can either have a language partner where you speak a language half the time and the other person's and then you speak the other language for the other half the time or you can find paid tutors finally one uh, technique that I used I lived in Seattle before I lived here in the Twin Cities and I'm sure it would work here uh, I contacted the English as a second language program at the University of Washington and I said hey do you have any Arabic speakers who are working on English they might be interested in trading um, half an hour for a half an hour and so we I've, I made friends with a guy and once or twice a week we would meet at the library uh, we would speak Arabic for half an hour and we would speak English for half an hour now his English is better than my Arabic but fortunately he was a very patient person and uh, <laughs> we had a good time we're still in contact you know many years later um, those are opportunities uh, I think for um, you know, those are different ways, but I would say the first thing is just, you know, just take the opportunity when you hear somebody speaking a language. When I was in San Francisco a few years ago, I was in Chinatown, and in front of the restaurants, they have barkers who are trying to get people to come into the restaurant. And uh, I'd say, how do you say, how do you say hello in Cantonese? And he couldn't understand me, so I, you know, I tried to. He couldn't understand English well enough to understand me. <laughs> So we would kind of speak back, and I would say, how do you say hello? And then he would say it back. I forgot how to say it now. But, um, you know, just take advantage of those. It, they're fun conversations to have. It's got, an, for people who are more introverted, there's kind of a built-in structure. How do you say this? And then they repeat it back. You don't have to be revealing. You don't have to keep your end of the conversation up. You can just repeat the same word over and over and over again. You don't have to be creative or anything. You just learn that word and you can have a good time. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for those ideas. And I didn't know you were going to mention italki. And just I'm going to take this opportunity to say I am one of those native speakers instructors at italki. <laughs> um, and it's a lot of fun meeting people from all over the world interested in learning my language and culture. I have a comment from Teresa who says, I love your idea of asking people if they speak a language other than English, other than facing directly with what language do they speak. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Teresa, for your comment. Anyone who's watching live or the recording, feel free to send your question or comment using the hashtag EPC show on Twitter or type your comment on the Google Plus event or on YouTube, even if you're watching the recording, and I'm sure I will get back to you. Um, so, Did, yes, yeah. definitely. I, sorry, just jump in one, one uh, other comment. The, um, what Teresa was saying, um, I found especially works well with Indians because there are so many Indians um, in the Twin City, and, they, and the there are so many Indians in the Twin Cities, and they all speak wonderful English. 
but a lot of them speak at least two or three other languages. And so if you ask them what other languages do they speak, it's a pretty interesting conversation. <laughs> Excellent. So there we are, our, our um, um, icebreaker for encountering other people and learning not only about their language, about their culture, and then we get closer to getting to know our community. Now, getting to know, uh, the, um, so thank you, Richard, for all those resources and your experience. We'll, we'll keep talking in a few minutes. But getting to know the community, it can be done in many different ways. And I recently learned about My City's Day, and Julie's here to tell us a little bit about her story and how that all started. Great, yeah. First of all, thanks also, Richard. That was fascinating, as always, to listen to you share your ideas. Uh, I still marvel at the number of languages you speak and hope I can just master two at this point. Um, but I just wanted to introduce you to a little bit of what City State does. And to do that, I'd like you to take a look at um, three pictures here that Paulina will show. Um, and make your best guess about which country you think each picture was taken in. So as you're taking a look, notice kind of the people, uh, what you see in the background, take a look at the flag, the interior of that building, the exterior of the building in the top picture, and just make your best guess about where you think these pictures might be taken. You have a little background information on City Stay already, um, but what we've found is that when we share these pictures, many people um, guess countries around the world. We've had guesses like Russia and Kazakhstan, and then we've had guesses like Mexico, um, of course, and some countries in East Africa. And in actuality, all of these pictures were taken right here in the Twin Cities. The top picture uh, is on Lake Street next to the Wilson Law Group building, um, and that was on Cinco de Mayo. Uh, it was a kind of festival that uh, many people went out to celebrate. And then the bottom two pictures are taken in faith communities here in the Twin Cities. Um, and here in the Twin Cities, we have such a rich cultural makeup, but we often don't recognize it because of the divisions between our communities. And as a result, at City State, we believe that we miss out on a great deal of opportunity for cross-cultural learning and dialogue. And that's where the idea for City State came from. And essentially what we do is we allow Minnesotans of all backgrounds to live with a new Minnesotan family from a different culture. Um, so essentially our students are kind of discovering a new world right in their own backyard. And we work predominantly with the Latino, Hmong, and Somali communities. And students of any background can participate and be a part of that homestay. Um, and the the kind of source of where City State came from um, was from my own experiences as an undergraduate. First I did a study away on the US-Mexico border and I was predominantly in southern El Paso. And then I also did a study abroad for a semester in Thailand. Um, and when I was on the border I was taking classes on, on both sides and um, I was really surprised to find how strikingly similar many parts of El Paso were to many parts of um, Juarez, where I was at in Mexico. Um, and the community in El Paso was more than 95%, in southern El Paso was more than 95% Mexican and Mexican-American. Um, and I was just at that point in my life so surprised to find a completely different face um, of the United States that I really hadn't been exposed to um, in such an immersive environment. Um, and I was really surprised, ultimately, that being in Texas for me was a more transformative experience than being in Thailand. Um, El Paso just looked and felt nothing like the United States I knew. So not, what, not only was it a cultural experience, like my cultural experience in Thailand, but there was also this other layer of kind of more discovery of who lives in, in our country and what their experience is like. Um, and that whole experience got me thinking about what untapped potential we have right in our own backyards for intercultural learning and dialogue. And that's where the idea for City State came from. Um, and, and I'd like to direct us to the next slide. Um, what, oftentimes when I talk about City State, I, I talk about how so many of us in the US and urban communities live in bubbles. And I think these maps can kind of help us get a better sense of what that means. We have New York, LA, Chicago, and the Twin Cities 
They're represented in those four maps. Um, and each dot represents a certain number of residents of a certain race. Red is white, blue is black, green is Asian, yellow is Hispanic, and orange is other. Um, and of course, race is more complicated than, than these kind of cut and dry categories for these maps. But for our purposes today, it's easy to see how ethnically um, and culturally divided we are here in the Twin Cities. Um, and the Twin Cities divisions here look much less dramatic. And a big piece of that is just population density when we compare um, our city to New York. Of course, the, the colors are not going to jump out as vibrantly because we don't have as many dots densely located on the map. Um, so essentially, with City State, we're trying to, to create some dialogue and relationship across these boundaries so that we can better know our neighbors and reduce some of the community mistrust that often happens between our communities. Um, and ideally kind of build some, some greater social equity as well. Um, and the last thing, Paulino had mentioned that it might be helpful to talk about some examples of, of who, who does our program and what that experience looks like. Um, and one of the most interesting examples recently, we did a program with Minnehaha Academy, uh, a local high school here in Minneapolis. And the students were really nervous, really apprehensive. And you know, Rich spoke to kind of how some of that anxiety can inhibit us as far as cross-cultural learning and language learning. Um, and so they wanted to do their home stays in pairs. And one of the pairs was a, a student who, who lived in the suburbs here, a white student who was born in Minnesota. Um, and he was paired with a student who, who was actually an international student. He has come from China and now lives in the United States permanently. Um, and they stayed together with the Hmong family. And both of them had such interesting um, and distinct learning experiences. The Chinese student had seen Hmong people when he lived in China, and then he came to the Twin Cities, and he saw Hmong people here. And he just had all of these questions about um, who exactly these neighbors were and why he's seen them in both of the countries that he's, he's lived in. Um, and so they both had very interesting experiences connecting with their distinct cultural backgrounds with the Hmong family that they were staying with. Um, and learning about that new community. Julie, could you please tell me a little bit of, uh, so we, we heard about the experience in general, and I would like you to, uh, if you can think of some uh, reflections of people who went through the program and what, what did they think they got out of it. But before we get there, can you walk me a little bit through the process? Uh, we we might have some some teachers or some people interested in this program, and it would be great for them to have an idea of what is a little bit of the process of joining or doing your program in the Twin Cities. Most of our programs now are linked to specific schools. So, for example, with Minnehaha Academy, they offer something really amazing, which is that uh, their students are required every year to spend a week doing an immersive cultural experience of some kind. And they must do that, I think it's four times, in order to graduate. Um, and so they kind of source students to us. Also, this year, we're starting a program with Creighton Durham Hall High School where it's just one day. Students are just going to be with a host family for one day. And we're excited about that because so many students are inhibited by the anxiety of living in someone else's home, especially someone who because this isn't just like, we don't only host with Latino families, we also host with Hmong and Somali families, and none of our students um, speak those languages, have ever spoken those languages, so um, that can cause a lot of anxiety. Um, so we're excited to be able to offer a day-long program as well with the host families. So if teachers were interested, um, I would encourage them to get in touch and to find a small group of students at their school who might be willing to participate, be it during the summer or spring break, um, because most student, most schools don't have the luxury of having cross-cultural curriculum be required for graduation like Minnehaha. Yeah, so I have a question from Teresa who um, is uh, joining and participating. Thank you very much, Teresa. And she's actually asking about what are the age restrictions for City State and what is the cost to participate? I understand you are focusing on high schools right now, but um, do you have any other programs or you, maybe that's an idea for the future for other people to participate that is not through schools? Yeah, we, we've had the restriction, restriction of just high school aged, um, so the minimum being a high school freshman. Um, 
And we've, we've never had anyone younger than sophomore apply to be in the program, so that's never been a consideration. We've also, we also hope to offer more opportunities at the college level, um, as well as to adults, but the challenge is always getting a cohort of people who are willing to do this together so that we can effectively run a program. Um, and it's been easiest to find those cohorts at the high school level. And what was the second part of the question? <laughs> what are the costs of to participate in the program? Right. Great question. One of our goals with City Stay is to make cross-cultural education accessible to a new body of participants because in general study abroad, which we often compare ourselves to kind of study abroad brought to the local level, um, study abroad has primarily been accessible to um, people of privilege and we hope that City Stay can widen the, widen the discussion because if someone has a family commitment or a financial commitment that keeps them here in the Twin Cities, they'd still be able to do a cross-cultural exchange, um, which in many cases study abroad is prohibitive because of financial or family reasons for many students. Um, so we try to make the program accessible to any, anybody who wants to participate, which means that we do offer scholarships. The full cost of the program um, is around $800, and most students don't have to pay that much to participate, and many pay nothing at all. Okay, good. So that's good information for any teachers or schools. Um, right now it's run only in the Twin Cities? Correct. Great, yeah. But it's it's a good model. You never know. Anyone who might be listening might contact you and start a similar program or a part of your program somewhere else. Um, but for now, it's available in the Twin Cities and any schools or teachers who are interested could contact you. We'll, we'll get to that at the end of the program. Um, but tell me a little more about what are people saying? What are these students saying about this experience? What are their reflections or comments after going through the program? Mm -hmm. um, many of them kind of describe it as eye-opening, um, especially because most students who go through our program have seen um, their Somali neighbors, they've seen Hmong neighbors, or they've seen um, Latino people in their community, and they walk around every day near these people without actually knowing anything about them, and often vice versa. We've had a lot of host families who have participated and said, every day I see white people on TV, and I don't know a thing about them. I don't know what their daily lives are like. I just know this kind of Hollywood stock image of, of what a white person is like. So our host families also are very interested in that learning process and getting to know more about a new culture um, in many cases. Uh, but one of the most memorable comments this year was um, from the Chinese student that I mentioned earlier who said that um, he learned more about Minnesota in the one week that he was staying with a Hmong host family than in the three years that he had spent in the U.S. Um, and I think City Stay offers such an immersive experience and so much new content. For example, one of the exercises that we do um, is mapping Lake Street. So students start in a particular neighborhood at one end of Lake Street in Minneapolis and they go through it and they kind of catalog what they see and they might be cataloging what kind of graffiti or murals they're seeing in different neighborhoods. Uh, they might be looking at what kinds of, um, what one student chose the theme of what are the mannequins wearing in different neighborhoods along Lake Street. Another one um, cataloged the kinds of drinks that you could buy in different areas. Um, and there's so many dramatic changes along that street in who lives there and who works there and what we see, that students are, are really exposed to a much broader range of who's in Minnesota than many of them are within their kind of bubble communities. That's a great activity, and I know that uh, My City State is available in the Twin Cities, but for all the language teachers out there, or any, any teachers who want to connect with their community, that's a great activity that you can do uh, with your students or ask your students to do, maybe for extra credit, to mm -hmm. survey their community. Um, one of the challenges of language teachers uh, is to bring the connection with the community sometimes. Like um, Richard mentioned, we are in this culture where we have our app, we have our textbook, and we can learn, or we think we can learn a language just from that, and uh, having the interaction or the connection with the community doesn't come as easy 
Um, and so that's a great activity. So people take note. <laughs> <laughs> and one other thing that we often do with that activity is that we have students craft some kind of interview questions, and as they're going down the street, they will stop someone or they'll go to a business and ask the owner or, the, or they'll ask customers, um, you know, what's your experience like living in the Twin Cities? Where do you come from? And what do you like about living here? What do you not like about living here? Uh, and it opens up some really incredible conversations. And one reason that I think it's particularly helpful is because unlike Rich and Paulino, a lot of people, especially young students, have those anxieties about, oh, how do I approach someone? And what will they say if I ask them a question? And how do I start the conversation? And this assignment, or project rather, really gives them the tools to start those conversations and kind of have a pretext for it so that they don't feel um, as vulnerable as they might normally. <laughs> Great. And uh, as you mentioned that you're focusing on high school, but we have people like Teresa, who's not in the Twin Cities, but other people, adults, who are in the Twin Cities who might be interested in the project. Uh, I know that you are planning uh, a workshop where anyone can attend and learn about the different cultures in these communities. Um, I know that that's coming up. If you can tell me mm -hmm. a little more about, about that. I know Richard yeah. is involved. He is. Rich is, the, is one of the fantastic leaders of the learning and dialogue for these two days. So it's a day-long opportunity, and there are two days to choose between, September 20th or October 3rd. It's held at McAllister College. Um, and the main purpose of the workshop is to improve our skills communicating across communities or across cultures. And we put specific emphasis on the Latino, Hmong, and Somali experience here in the Twin Cities and kind of deepening our knowledge of how we can effectively communicate across those divides. I don't know, if Rich, if you have anything else to offer about what you might be including in, in the content you share in the workshop. Um, you know, the engagement is the word that I try to use and try to um, place importance on. Um, you know, a lot of times language learning is in the classroom is about going on vacation or work. But just talking to your neighbors is not a big focus on that. So a lot of what I like to talk about, and I've talked about in the past in the City Say workshops, is how do you enter into those uncomfortable discussions? How do you deal with that anxiety? And um, there's plenty of techniques um, that, that one can use, and so I'll be talking about that. Um, another thing that people get nervous about is they're going to offend somebody. If they go and just start talking to somebody from another culture, they're going to offend them. Uh, I heard a funny story. Um, there was a speaker who uh, from Somalia, and she said, you know, my white friend called me up and said, hey, we, I just got these new Somali neighbors. These Somalis moved in next door. And the person said, oh, did you, did you meet them? No, I didn't. I, I, I was nervous. I didn't know. I, I didn't want to offend them. And the Somali woman said, "Well, you're offending me by saying this. Just go and say hello to them." <laughs> <laughs> you know, people, people are not fragile. They're, they're not going to be offended if you go up and say hello to them and introduce yourself. And, um, but in you know our our culture as uh, uh, white Minnesotans, oftentimes is you know we want to. You know, we want to be sure to um, keep the the keep keep to ourselves, just so we don't accidentally move into someone else's personal space, either physical or uh, emotional. Um, but uh, what I'll be talking about is how do we get into that kind of personal space where we be open ourselves up, hoping that others will open up themselves and get into very educational and fulfilling conversations and dialogue. Perfect. And I'm sharing here the information is going to be on Sunday, September 20th, or start today, October 3rd. You can choose on one of those days from 9 to 4 p.m. at McAllister College in St. Paul. And you can register by September 15. Send an email to info at mycitystate.org. All this information will be included in the description of this video. And that's another way that you can uh, not only connect with My City State, but also learn about languages and cultures in your community. I would like to open up to um, going back to the topic of the connection 
between languages and cultures and to leave up to you to any comments, anecdotes or ideas that you may have on this topic in general from what you're doing right now in your daily life, your connection with your work or um, other people that you have heard of. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to uh, anxiety about learning about other people, that's one thing I keep hearing uh, a lot about. I keep seeing anxiety that um, creates these divisions among these cultures, and that's really what I think we have to confront in our culture is the fear. And uh, fear is usually the fear of becoming vulnerable. So the way that I believe that you can just just rip that Band-Aid off is to um, is to delve into the language. When I was uh, I was an exchange student in France when I was in high school, and I was trying to find my classes on the first day, and I was scared because I didn't know where to go. I was scared because I had to go. Uh, I didn't know what I was supposed to do, and so I said uh, to a teacher, "Hey, uh, I, I don't know where my class is." And she's like, uh, go ask over there, and didn't help me. And I thought of what I said, and I said it all wrong. I used the wrong, I used the tu instead of the vu with a teacher, and I was just a kid, and so I sounded rude and all this kinds of thing. And then I said to myself, you know, I'm going to be here five months. If by the end of five months I can sound like an intelligent five-year-old, I'll be fine. I will have made progress. So... You don't have to expect yourself to know everything. You don't have to expect yourself to be perfect. Just try to get to the next level. You know, if you can speak like a two-year-old, try to speak like a three-year-old. If you can speak like a three-year-old, speak like a four-year-old. And so I think that, uh, you know, just delving in is something that, you know, we can always try to do. If you know two words, then do three words. If you know three words, learn four words. Um, so that's what I think uh, people can work on in order just to get over the anxiety. You get over the anxiety about talking to your neighbors and all of a sudden new uh, opportunities for understanding and growth and connection develop around you. Great. Thank you very much for, for your comment, Richard. And Julie, besides the workshop exploring the cultures of the Twin Cities, is this something you plan to, or My Cities Take plans to do more in the future? Uh, we want to continue offering workshops for professionals, especially educators and healthcare workers who uh, work with diverse communities and kind of better equipping them to. Uh, communicate effectively and work effectively across cultures. We want to build the number of cohort programs that we're running. So um, partner with more schools and possibly colleges as well um, to offer more programs where groups are running through the city stay model. Um, so that's our main goal right now is just to expand the number of students and families that we're able to reach. Great. And if people have more questions or comments, can they can they also contact you at info at mycitystate.org? Absolutely. Perfect. And we'll have that information in the description of this video. Richard, do you have anything else that you want to promote? This is your time. Promote yourself. <laughs> so I hate to do this. I have one thing I wanted to promote about City Stay before I go to promote myself. So don't <laughs> let me forget to promote myself. But one thing that Julie told me early on about City Stay, one of the reasons why she likes this model, and I agree with her 100%, is that on a standard study abroad program, you go, you travel 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 miles away, you meet a bunch of people, and then you go back home, and maybe you'll go back and visit one day. One of the things that my City Stay offers is that once you make a connection with these people, they just live across town. You can have as much contact with them as you want into the future. And one of the things that I think City Stay has as an advantage over a study abroad program is that you're in your own city and you have those relationships that you can develop through the years. And um, that, I think, is a huge advantage of uh, City Stay over a study abroad program. Not just that it's way, more, way cheaper. You don't need a plane ticket to get there. A bus <laughs> ticket is fine. Um, but that'll be the new tagline. You don't need a plane ticket. A bus ticket is fine. Um, <laughs> but uh, you, get a continue to, to, you get to continue the conversation uh, face to face, and I think that's wonderful.
But if I might promote myself now, definitely. Um, I, <laughs> so after the city stay, after the city stay, um, uh, um, the last city stay workshop, I'm going to be traveling to New York to speak at the Polyglot Conference um, about choosing your language from among languages in your community and the importance of that. Uh, so that's the Polyglot Conference, October 9th and 10th in New York City. Uh, and then um, October um, October 23rd and 24th is the Minnesota Council of Teachers of Language and Culture. Then they'll be, uh, and I'll be uh, speaking at one of the breakout sessions um, there here in the Twin Cities. And that talk will be about um, how the language teacher can be the bridge for uh, immigrant families um, and dialogue uh, it, within the school. And then coming up in next year in March, I'll be speaking for the second time uh, at a breakout session at the, um, the Forum on Diversity and Inclusion, which is a big uh, HR, um, HR conference talking about the importance of a, a multilingual workplace, how to look at it as an advantage and a resource as opposed to an obstacle. Perfect. Yes, you got all your promotion. Perfect. I hope so. And then don't forget to read my blog. <laughs> your blog is, tell us one more time. My blog is lovinglanguage.wordpress.com. Uh, recently, I've been talking about the so-called problem of immigrants who supposedly are not learning English, immigrants who keep speaking their language besides English, those darn foreigners who come to our country and speak <laughs> language besides English. Um, uh, <laughs> how, you know, the, the, import, the importance of fostering this as opposed to opposing this state of affairs in the U.S. Another concept I like to blog about I call ecolinguism which is understanding the diversity of languages in a social um, uh, uh, ecosystem and understanding the importance of all these languages and how they interact within the place uh, that you live. There is no doubt that you are a language lover and very passionate about it. So maybe I'll have to bring you back and we'll have a discussion of all these very interesting topics. But for now, I want to say thank you very much for being part of this program. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And you can still submit your comments and questions. I'll make sure to send them to uh, Richard and Julie. So Julie, thank you very much for being part of this program. Thank you for having me. It was really a joy to be in conversation with both of you. And thank you, Richard. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about the thing I'm most passionate about. And thank you for all the work you put into producing this show and, and roping us together to, to get together <laughs> to have this fantastic conversation. So I really appreciate your work and your perseverance, Paulino. I, it's an honor for me to be here. Thank you very much. I'm also very passionate about languages and about also sharing uh, with people uh, different perspectives of educators, performers, and educators, and that's why we have this show. So keep watching, and um, if you go to epcshow.com, you can subscribe to learn about new shows, and you can also send suggestions at q at epcshow.com, the letter Q, uh, about what you want to see in the future. For now, this is Educators, Performers, Creators Shows. I'm Paulino Brenner. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.